Uh, good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you're watching this. Um, I'm on the west coast of the United States, and I'm here today with Timothy Snyder, uh, who is in on the east coast. Uh, he's in, in New Haven, and Yuval Noah Hariri, who is in Israel. Um, but we know that we're speaking to people in Europe, people in America, um, people around the world. Um, the topic of this morning's conversation could not be more important or more significant. We're going to talk about Ukraine, not just the ongoing invasion and the destruction that we've all watched on our television screens, but also the place of Ukraine in world history, um, the place of Ukraine in European history, the significance of this invasion for, uh, for, for Europeans, for Americans, for really the whole world. Um, we will be joined um, part of the way through the conversation in a few minutes by a Ukrainian member of parliament, Igor Chanayev, who is uh, a veteran of the long war, Ukrainian war with Russia. He's now in the territorial army. He is fighting as we speak, but he will come and join the call um, in, the, in the first part of our conversation um, in order to tell us what's, what's going on. Um, in addition, you will see on your screen a link uh, that will take you to a group of charities um, if you want to contribute during or after this conversation uh, to the war effort or to the medical efforts or to the refugees in Ukraine. Um, most of those, most of you will know who, who I'm speaking to today, but let me briefly say um, Professor Timothy Snyder is really one of the world's great experts on Ukraine and Ukrainian history. Um, his book Bloodlands uh, was the really one of the first books to situate and to understand the, war, the role that Ukraine played in its significance uh, during the Second World War. It wasn't, it wasn't an accidental part of the world or, or it, was a, it was a central piece of what the Nazis and the Soviet Union were fighting over. He's also eloquently written about the Maidan events of 2014 and their significance um, uh, elsewhere. Um, Yuval Noah Harari is a, well, he's really a historian of everything. He's written a brilliant historian of the human race, um, but he's also recently written about the significance that this particular war has for, uh, for all of us and why it's breaking, it's taking us backwards. It's taking us into a different time, uh, why it has some of, the, some of the things that humanity had achieved and Europeans had achieved in the last several decades, why this war um, undermines those. Um, let me start with Tim. Um, uh, Tim, can you, can, you, can you begin this call by talking about uh, the significance of Ukraine in European history? And, and, and because I've often found in the last few days as I've been talking about Ukraine on television and um, at public events, um, that people don't know much about Ukrainian history. Um, why is it that they don't know much? Um, who, who are the Ukrainians and, um, you know, and, and, and what special role have they played in the history of Europe? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, it's paretem jak se skazu hotiv by dužestiro vsim ukrajinskim kolehom djakovate o bez beznik ja ja ne buv bi tim historikum jaki buv bi jak jak mik bi vypovedati na tiu pitanju in ja djakuju. So um, Ukraine is uh, Ukraine is a typical European country, just more so. Um, Ukraine has a, a medieval period with many of the interesting features of medieval history. It has a conversion to Christianity. It's just more interesting because there were also uh, Judaic and Islamic and actually multiple Christian options that were considered. Um, the people who were converting were Vikings or their descendants, which is also very typical of European history, but maybe a little bit more so because these Vikings founded a state pretty far to the south of where they came from. Ukraine has a very interesting early modern period. It passes through the Renaissance. Um, it passes through the Reformation, just maybe a little bit more so. The Renaissance has multiple language questions as opposed to just one, as it was in most of Europe. The Reformation has multiple religious options as opposed to just one or two or three in most of Europe. And Ukraine has a very typical uh, modern period. In the 19th century, in the territory where Ukraine now lies north of the Black Sea, uh, there was a very typical national movement. It was subjected to an unusual degree of oppression inside the Russian Empire. Um, it moved to Austria, where it became central. In the 20th century, Ukraine, again, very typically began with the struggle for national liberation after the First World War. But 
It failed largely because of the success of the Russian Revolution and the creation of, of the Soviet Union. Everyone in the Soviet Union recognized that Ukraine was a nation. The Soviet Union was formed the way it was because the Ukrainian question was so important. As a result, it wasn't just some generic revolutionary state. It had national divisions, federal units, one of which was Ukraine. In the 20th century, Ukraine was at the center of both of the major totalitarian aspirations. Stalin wished to create the Soviet Union by exploiting Ukraine. Hitler wished to create a German empire in Eastern Europe, also chiefly by exploiting Ukraine, which means that Ukraine was the most dangerous place to be during the totalitarian period of European history when both Hitler and Stalin were in power 1933 to 1945. Since the end of the Soviet Union, since 1991, Ukraine has been an independent state. And many of the people who are forming Ukraine now and fighting for Ukraine now were formed within that period. In both 2004 and 2014, Ukrainians rose up to try to prevent an oligarch backed by Russia from weakening their institutions, their state, and their future. And it's that experience which largely explains why, even if we don't know who Ukrainians are, Ukrainians do, knew, do know very well who they are themselves. So it's to Ukraine, to me, what's interesting about Ukrainians sort of Ukrainian-ness is that it's really an identity that was formed in the spirit of rebellion, in opposition to wow. an establishment originally to the nobility, to the czarist empire, later on to the Soviet empire, um, and more recently in opposition to the idea of an autocratic, kleptocratic dictatorship. And to me, one of the unique things about Ukraine is the way in which the, the national identity, the definition of who we are, has now become bound up in an idea of democracy. Um, you know, we are because we want democracy and because we want Western integration and because we want that form of civilization that makes us Ukrainian, um, and that's why we're fighting against. You know, it, it's it's not against the Russian people. In fact, you know, Ukrainians are very fond of Russians, and you know, they're they're you know, they're, of course, they speak Russian and they absorb a lot of Russian culture, but it's the objection to the autocratic. Um, Putin, Putinist state um, and the, that form of that, that political system is what they don't like and what they want to overthrow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it's also interesting to me, and maybe um, I'll switch to Yuval can talk about this too. Um, one of the other interesting things about Ukraine is the degree to which without anybody ever telling them what, the, what is the difference between ethnic nationalism and civic nationalism, they have, they have chosen a form of civic nationalism. In other words, you can be Ukrainian if you if that's your idea of who you are, you can speak Russian, you can speak Ukrainian, you can be Jewish. Ukraine has a Jewish president. Um, but as long as you are willing to participate in that national project, you, you know, you're on our side. So it's not it's not that you're a member of this particular tribe. It's that you're a member of the of the of the of the community. Um, you, you've all, could, you, could you situate that idea for us? Um, is that something that's is that new and recent in, in, in history? And, and would you make the same observation about Ukraine? Well, I think that the whole war is about the existence of the Ukrainian nation. Um, Putin's idea is that there is no Ukraine. This is his whole rationale, his whole reason for the war. He's built this fantasy in his head that, there, that Ukraine doesn't exist, that Ukrainians are just Russians and that they want to be absorbed by Russia and are prevented by some gang of Nazis. And this fantasy has led him to invade Ukraine, expecting that Zelensky will just flee, the army would surrender, and the population would throw flowers on the Russian tanks. And he's just completely wrong about everything. Ukraine, as we've just heard, and as we see, is a very, very real nation. Zelensky didn't flee, the uh, army is fighting like hell, and the population is throwing Molotov cocktails on the Russian tanks, not flowers. And in this sense, he has already lost, Putin has already lost the war, because this is a war about the very existence of the Ukrainian nation, and now the entire world knows. I mean, I don't know what people knew about Ukraine a week ago or two weeks ago, now everybody around the world know that Ukraine is a very, very real nation. And you see the admiration around the world for Ukraine. And I think there is something deeper happening here, which also explains the, 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 the reaction that I see in Europe, in the USA and elsewhere. 
that you know, the West has been torn, and you spoke about different kinds of nationalism. The West has been torn in recent years in a culture war between left and right, between liberals and conservatives, which really revolved around the question of, of nationalism and liberalism. We somehow got this mistaken idea in the West that you have to choose, that nationalism and liberalism are opposite, and you can be one or the other. And this is the deep root of the culture war in the West. And Ukraine showed us this is not true. You don't need to think in these binary terms. Nationalism and liberalism can be allies. If you understand nationalism not as hatred of foreigners or hatred of minorities, but as loving your compatriots and taking care of them, then nationalism and liberalism go together. They unite around the values of freedom and of taking care of your fellow citizens. And this is why both left and right, I've been watching you know, CNN and Fox News, they are suddenly on the same page. They are cheering the same heroes. So I think that one, one very important change that can come out of this war is that maybe this is the chance to end the culture war in the West and to remind ourselves that there is no contradiction between liberalism and nationalism, and that they both have the same enemy in the figure of Putin and in the ideology of Putinism. Um, thank you. I, I, I agree with that, and I want to continue with that, um, with, with that conversation. I mean, I think even if you use the word patriotism instead of nationalism, then people automatically understand what you mean. Yeah. Um, I understand, though, that we've, we've had our intro introductory comments. We are now going to be joined by Yegor Chernayev, who is a member of the Ukrainian parliament. He's, he's a veteran, a long-term veteran of the war, and he's also now part of the territorial army. Um, he has come in from, from the battle. He's joining the conversation, and he will talk about um, what's happening now, why it's important, and what the Ukrainians want from us, from people outside of the country, from the West, and from the world. Welcome, Igor. Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, in this difficult for Ukraine time, uh, we really appreciate your support, your unity of the Western world, um, your actions, actually, because uh, there are not so much um, tools which can be used by Western world and by, by Ukraine to stop uh, to stop uh, Putin. Um, unfortunately, for now, we have um, not maybe, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, I, I think this is the manifestation of the weakness from the Putin's army because they started uh, bombing civil population. They started pop, uh, bombing and, and heavy shelling by rockets, by missiles to civil people. And this is, I think, like an agony of a Russian army because they cannot to uh, invade, in, to, to occupy any big city in, in, um, in Ukraine. They faced with the, the highest level of resistance from our, not only army, but also um, the, the Ukrainian people who, as um, Mr. Harari said, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, try, uh, well, um, don't use the um, flowers, but use the bombs against, uh, against Russia, Russia um, Federation. So um, for now, it's quite a difficult situation in, in Ukraine. And my, my, um, and not only my, but, but uh, the whole nation ask to Western world, it's number one. What do we need right now? It's uh, establishing uh, the, 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 the no-fly zone over Ukraine. It means that uh, our allies can help us with their, um, If you heard um, right now, we I, I hear the siren of mm -hmm. the um, air attack, actually, uh, because in a few minutes I think Kiev will be bombed by Russian Federation. Uh, 
again and again, time by day by day. They do this not only in Kiev, but also in Kharkiv and other cities of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but what do we, we, we need? It's no fly zone over Ukraine. Um, NATO and allies can do this, can provide us with this support. It means that uh, in the sky over Ukraine shouldn't be any aircraft or any missile from the Russian Federation side. It should be shooted uh, from even from the Black Sea ships, warships of, of NATO or from the um, some ground uh, anti-missile, anti-aircraft systems from uh, countries of, of, of NATO or of, of countries of EU, because we have uh, some of them. We have anti-aircraft systems, but it's not enough. We have a lack of this, um, of this kind of weapon, uh, and we need support. So this is the, the first and the most important thing that Western world can do uh, to support Ukraine and to um, deter Russia from the further actions in our in our country. Another thing, uh, of course, the sanctions. The sanctions should be effective as much as possible to um, to destroy actually economy of Russia Federation, because uh, only this thing, I, um, in my point of view, can. Um, start can be the start point of the protests in Russia Federation because because of propaganda they the Russian people uh, don't know what exactly how many Russian soldiers was um, they lost in Ukraine it's over 5,000 for now it's more than in the first um, it's more than the first of uh, che uh, the war in Chechnya. Mm -hmm. uh, they lost in, in, in this during these six six days. Uh, so um, the SWIFT should be should be um, the, the all banks of Russia Federation should be withdrawn from the SWIFT system. Not only five banks or uh, or something like this. There. Um, assets of oligarchs should be frozen around the world. Uh, they should feel the pressure, feel the pressure. Their um, closest um, circle of Russia, of Putin um, people. I mean, these oligarchs, officials, et cetera, et cetera. So this is maybe the most, the most um, effective things that Western world can do for Ukraine for right now, right now. Hmm. All right, I muted myself because it's very noisy where I am. Um, Igor, uh, as, as we understand it, the original Russian plan was just to walk into the country and kind of have a coup de, a fake coup d'etat in Kiev and take over. Um, that plan failed, and I'd be interested to hear from Tim also why he thinks it failed. Um, why did it fail, and what is the Russian strategy now? Um, maybe you, you, you go first, and then Tim, and then you all. Um, well, I think this, the main strategic um, the main strategic problem of Putin was uh, that he uh, thought that the same situation will be in, in, in Ukraine as it was in 2014. And, Ukraine, yeah. and actually, um, of course, unfortunately, in 2014, there were, uh, there were um, um, several towns which, uh, which was occupied without any 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 shoot. Um, that's that's why Putin Putin thought that uh, he will invade in Ukraine and occupy Ukraine in a two days. Mm -hmm. uh, he, the Ukrainian will not resist, and the Ukrainian army will just uh, will be surrounded uh, and fail. Uh, but 
um, but the lost is but, but uh, right now um, I think the strategy um, a little bit another one. Uh, he tried to um, occupy um, the capital. He tried to occupy uh, Kiev. He tried to um, kill. I think this is actually the proper word: kill uh, our president and and uh, and the government just to reestablish the, the government and president. And they, according to our information, Yanukovych, the former president, all, uh, have uh, right now uh, in Minsk, what for? I don't know. So maybe one of the, to, to replace by Yanukovych uh, the president. So um, I think this is the next uh, strategy and next step of what can be done by Putin right now. Mm -hmm. Tim, do you want to add to that? No, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we, we actually now know both from the way that the operation proceeded and from some documents that were accidentally published that the goal was to move in quickly, um, kill the leadership, establish another government, and imagine that the rest of Ukraine would just go along. Now that that hasn't happened, I think we're, I, I agree that we're at a second stage. I think the first stage was, um, the, the, the problem with the first stage was that the Russian people we're not prepared for a long war. And this creates an important opening. I mean, I think the idea was that this is all going to be over so quickly that we don't have to prepare the Russian people for a war. And that's why Russian propaganda this time around has been so obtuse and unconvincing, even for a lot of Russians. I think now what we have is a Putin who has been defied. Um, and we have a second stage of the war, which is a kind of random fury. I think it too has not been very carefully planned, but because the leader is angry and spiteful, we're gonna see standard Russian tactics, which involve, sadly, the encirclement and the attempt to destroy civilian populations inside cities. I think that's what we're, that's what we're looking, looking ahead towards now. Um, I'm told that Igor has to leave. Um, he's returning <laughs> He's returning to the fighting. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will repeat your plea for Western help and aid and for um, for Western military aid in particular at the end of this program and, and during during throughout it. So thank you so yeah, much. And I just want to add that the, the, the entire world admires your courage. You, you fight for the freedom of the entire world. I mean, thank you. The, the, I, and I would add that the just so that you know and you can tell other people that the image of Ukraine and the definition of Ukraine in many places all over the world has changed overnight. It's, it's a different country now. It's seen as a different country. It has a different role in, in the world already just because of what you've done in the last week. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We are fighting not only for Ukraine, but uh, for the whole Western world and democratic world for this democratic values. And I hope, really hope for this support from the Western world in the in the sky of, of our Ukraine. Um, thank you. They are big, but we are brave. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so you, 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 you've all, um, this extraordinary thing that we've seen, the, the plan was to, to the, you know, Putin imagined that there was no Ukraine, that you could just walk in. You could no, I think it is. is his problem is the, like the most fundamental problem of every dictator, that people around him are so afraid to tell him the truth that eventually he become convinced, completely convinced of his own lies. He said so many times that there is no Ukraine and the people around him said, yes, 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 there is no Ukraine. The Ukrainians just want to join us, that he lost touch with reality. And the, the dangerous thing is that when such a person with so much power, uh, uh, you know, crashes against reality, he doesn't just acknowledge his mistake. This is the, the you know, the, the most fundamental problem for dictatorship is that when the dictator makes a mistake, he, do, he can't admit it. And there is nobody around, not any pa independent parties, not the citizens, not the media that can tell him, you've made a mistake. And he just doubles down. And the biggest danger is if, if we want to know what's coming next, we should just look at Syria. He's also the person behind what happened in Homs. He's the person behind what happened in Aleppo. 
And what keeps me up at night, literally, is that I, I fear that he will try to do that also in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, in these places. And my hope is that the Russian people would not be able to stomach that. You know, in Aleppo, in Homs, the Russians bombed from the air. But the, the slaughter on the ground, it was Syrians slaughtering Syrians. It's different when it's Russian soldiers fighting and some slaughtering Ukrainians, that it's Russian soldiers who are dying. And it's, you know, Russians and Ukrainians are family. It's literally, there are people that, they, you know, one brother is in Moscow, one sister is in Kyiv. So with Putin, I, I have no expectations. I think he, he has no limits, no boundaries. But I hope that the Russian people would not stomach that. Uh, Tim, you're a student of Putin. You've written at least one book and many articles about him and his mentality. Um, what do you think he's capable of? Why did he misunderstand Ukraine? Um, and what might stop him? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think there, you know, there, as Yuval says, there's the classic issue of tyranny here. I mean, what Yuval is saying basically comes from, you know, books four and five of uh, chapters eight and nine of uh, Plato's Republic. I mean, we're, hmm. we're, in, we're in Plato territory or Shakespeare territory. We're, we're with the aging, lonely tyrant who can't listen and, and, ha and has to escalate. What I, what I would emphasize is a related point, which has to do with, with past and future. We're seeing a kind of confrontation of, of history, like history in the sense of things that actually happen and people who make choices that matter. History with, with myth. Putin has a myth. His myth is that for a thousand years, there was, a Ukra there was Ukraine, Belarus, Russia together. And if something disturbs that myth, it must be an alien, an outsider. It must be, it must be the West who's responsible. And he now, as Yuval says, he now seems to actually believe in something like that. He seems to really believe that there is a Ukraine. It owes everything to Russia. He seems to really believe that it was only the Russians who suffered during the Second World War and not the Jews or the Belarusians or the Ukrainians. He seems to believe these things. And he also seems to be chiefly concerned, not with what happens right now, but with becoming, being remembered as a great Russian leader in the future which is another reason why I think he's not so concerned personally with the losses of Russian soldiers or the Russian economy or Russian interests in any broad sense. I think he's beyond all of that, which is why we need policies of sanctions and other very tough policies to force a conversation to happen inside Russia around Putin so that it can somehow reach Putin. You, you've all, would you agree with that analysis? Yeah, and I think that he, He's at the stage that, yes, he's thinking about his place in history. And he's just also completely wrong about that. He, you know, Russians and Ukrainians after the fall of the Soviet Union, they are not enemies. Yes, they went their separate ways, but as part of a family in a way. He, he is creating with his own hand, it's just him. He is turning them into enemies. This will be his legacy. He is planting seeds of hatred for generations. And this will be his legacy for the regional history. And, you know, if you look even broader at, at the whole world, then um, he's dragging the whole of humankind back to the jungle, back to an era of war that we thought we have already left behind us. Since 1945, it, 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 didn't, it became unacceptable for one power to simply try to obliterate a weaker nation off the first face of the earth, off, off the map. Yes, countries, they had civil wars of many kinds, you had all kinds of interventions. Uh, some countries collapsed due to internal disagreements. But what was basic in history previously, that the big fish eat the little fish, that just because you're big and strong, you can invade your neighbor and just obliterate them, this became unacceptable. And I think part of what we are seeing with the amazing reaction of, of, of especially Europe, but also other parts of the world, is that people instinctively realize that if aggression is allowed to win in Ukraine, 
if uh, a big country can again obliterate a weaker neighbor just because it's, it wants to, everybody around the world will go back to the jungle. Not just because there are so many other conflicts, so many other people watching what is happening to see if they can do it also, but you know, just you know, think about it in, in, in terms of numbers. People sometimes say that the, the idea of the long peace that we've been living through has been a fantasy of, I don't know, poets and artists and, 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 and leftist intellectuals. Not so. It has been numbers in budgets. You look at the defense budgets of governments. In 2020, globally, the average defense budget of a, of a country is about 6% of the budget. In Europe, it's about 3%. Historically, this is absolutely amazing. For most of history, emperors and kings and princes, they spend 40%, 50%, 70% on their military. Just 3% or 6%, this is the basis why we have a good healthcare system, education system. And now, the day after the invasion, Germany doubled its defense budget. And I completely agree, this is what they should do in this situation. But everybody understand, if we allow this to happen, if we allow aggression to win, then it will hurt every person on, 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 on the planet, and not just the immediate people involved in Ukraine and Russia. Um, no, I very much agree with that. Um, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, yeah, we, we all became used to, we, we've made assumptions about how the world is. Um, we learned to live with it and we, we failed to see that Putin posed this different kind of threat. Tim, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Why, so one of the things that's very extraordinary things that's happened in the last week is that, I mean, literally two weeks ago, I was on a German television program and I was arguing that Germany should arm Ukraine. And in my argument was that if you want peace in Europe, you want Putin not to invade Ukraine, then you must arm Ukraine so that they can deter Russia. And there were three German politicians on the program who bitterly disagreed with me. You know, there can only be dialogue. The only solution to this can be peaceful. Germany cannot participate in any European war. It's impossible, it can't be done. And, you know, literally two weeks later, we have a completely different change of tone in Germany. Can you talk about what, what were the origins of that first view and what's happened? Mm -hmm. You know Germany well. All right, so uh, l let, me take a, let me take a broad view for a second. I mean, I think what we're observing has to do with this larger process in, in European history, which is what do you do after empire? The, the Europeans found a very good answer about what to do after empire, which is European integration. So um, European integration has served an increasing amount of Europe very well as the, the economic and the cultural basis for, for peace and prosperity for three generations now. Uh, and the Ukrainians understand this very well, hmm. which is why in, in 2004 and in 2014 and, and now as President Zelensky applies for European Union membership, they've put Europe at the center of their thoughts and words even as they face incredible struggles. So you, in Europe, you can either have inter integration or you can have empire. Russia is the last important European country which is still on the side of empire. The Russian state is constructed now in such a way that given oligarchy, given the lack of rule of law, given the essential impossibility of domestic policy, all that remains are imperial adventures to try to uh, make a leader content and a, and a, and a population distracted. I think what European leaders are understanding, and I think German leaders are now central to all of this, is that this process of, of European integration, which began with economics, moves slowly forward to politics, also has to involve security in the broadest sense of the word, that a Europe that is going to be whole and free also has to be a Europe which is capable of defending itself, mm -hmm. capable of defending those who are willing to defend it, right? I mean, right now, European history is being made in Ukraine in large measure because it's the Ukrainians who are willing to put their bodies in the way of risk, harm, and death in, in, in order to protect things that people, broadly speaking, care about. But there's one more thing going on here with the Germans, um, which I want to try to quickly explain, and with many other people in the West. And it has to do 
with the perversion of the language of the Holocaust. When Mr. Putin says that he wants to denazify Ukraine, he's pushed a, a lot of buttons that he didn't want to push. I've had a lot of private conversations with a lot of significant people who have been trying to understand those remarks because they understand that there's something fundamentally wrong with a war that aims to kill a Jewish president and undo a democracy, which is supposedly being, named, being made in the name of denazification. And I think what people have understood in the last few days is that what Russia is doing is not just making war against an innocent nation here. Russia is also, or at least the Russian leadership, is deliberately undoing the linguistic and the moral structures that we drew from the Second World War. Hmm. Um, the, the words genocide and the words Nazi are very important to the whole moral structure which undergirds how many countries, European, North American, and also others, have, have, have set up a better version of life after the Second World War. In perverting all of that, in debasing all of that, Mr. Putin is not only going after a country, which is bad enough, he's going after a whole moral structure. And I think people have come to understand that, and that has something to do with, with this solidarity and with this certainty that something is deeply, deeply wrong with this invasion. Not just, not just killing people and attempting to destroy a nation, which is bad enough, but also just the full-throated cynical nihilism of it all. Mm -hmm. And maybe I would li like to add specifically about Germany, because as, as historians, we are constantly aware of the centrality of the past in, in shaping the present, in shaping the future. And you know, I would like to say to Germans, German politicians and Germans in general, as a historian, as a Jew, as an Israeli, um, we know that you are not Nazis. You don't need to keep proving it again and again. You don't need to be afraid that if you pick up a gun or that if you raise your voice, we will think that you are Nazis. We know you are not. What we need from Germany is to stand tall and lead. This is the now, it's now the leader of Europe. If you really want to make amends for the crimes of the Nazi era, it's not by being neutral, it's not by standing aside. You should be at the forefront of the fight for freedom, for democracy. This will be the best atonement for the crimes of the Nazi period. One of the conclusions that I've begun to make in the last few days is that the, the sort of lesson from history that Germans have been telling themselves that they've learned, and this applies more broadly to Europeans, actually, it's not just the Germans, the sort of lesson from history, and you hear this in, you hear this in Brussels, you hear it a, a bit in elsewhere, the lesson from history is that we must be pacifists, you know, we mustn't fight. Um, and actually, that's the wrong lesson from history. You know, the lesson from history is that we must um, fight against tyranny, we must fight against autocracy, we must fight against, um, against genocide. Um, I mean, you know, to, to, to some extent, no, we shouldn't just throw, throw away the, the whole pacifist message. I think, yes, the message is we should do everything in our power before we have to fight. We should go the extra mile. You should explore all the other options because war is terrible. And especially when we are talking about war between superpowers with nuclear capabilities, we should be extremely, extremely careful. And I think that, you know, this is, a, a, again, a mistake that dictators make er, repeatedly, that when they see uh, liberal countries and democratic countries trying to avoid war, trying to find a diplomatic solution, trying to appease, they read this as weakness. And it's not weakness. I think that, you know, underneath the, the, the layers of comfortable fat, there is a lot of muscle. And there is also the understanding that we don't, the, the, you don't want to use that muscle. It's terrible for everybody. But there should be the, also the deep commitment that if there is no other choice, then there is no other choice. And but, I think that what's happening now is that people in Germany and elsewhere have realized that this is it. Th that's the moment of truth. There is no point reserving it for, for some other day. The day has come. It's now is the moment of truth. But the, they've re they've realized it, though, Yuval, thanks to Ukrainians. 
they haven't realized yes. it all on their own. They've realized it thanks to Ukrainians. And I guess my my version of what Anne just said would be something like this, that if you really do have values like democracy and freedom, there's an inherent risk associated with those values. And those values don't come on their own. There's no larger historical process that guarantees them. There's no arrangement mm. that preserves them that's permanent. There come moments, and this is something that historians see, there come moments when individual choices matter and are essential. And I would say that this is one of those moments that it's easier, it's, the Ukrainians have made it easier for the Germans and the Europeans and the Americans and everyone else to recognize these values and defend them because they're defending them themselves. And there's a curious way in which what the Ukrainians are now doing in these hours and days magnifies out into the rest of the world. I have this feeling that every day that the Ukrainians resist is giving us another year or another decade of the kind of life we're used to having. Every day that they fight mm -hmm. magnifies outwards and gives us a chance to reflect and affirm and, and to act on our own. Um, yeah. Uh, well, go ahead. No, I think that, that, that I completely agree. I mean, and even more than that, they just give courage to the whole world. You know, the first day or two that people were not sure, and when you see how, you know, people with bare hands trying to stop a tank, then everybody, from the politicians in Brussels and Washington down to individual citizens, they ask themselves, if they can fight against tanks with bare hands, what can I do? Mm -hmm. One of the, um, you know, one of the other things that's that suddenly has changed, I think, in the last week, um, is this, you know, the the assumption that of progress, you know, that we would the world is a place that's constantly getting better, um, that that democracy is a is a thing that will always spread. Um, of course, that that is that assumption of the inevitability of progress and the inevitability of improvement. Um, you know, I think it has been undermined quite a bit in the last few years, not least um, in the United States by the by the political reaction there. Um, but but Tim, you've written a lot about the danger of inevitability. You know, when people assume that you know, you know, that, you know they assume that Ukraine can survive without us having to do anything in particular. They assume that everything will go on the way it is because this is obviously the best of all possible worlds. Um, you know, talk a little bit about why that was a wrong assumption and how we should be thinking differently. What should we be doing now? If, if, if the world isn't automatically getting better, how does that change the way we approach it and how should we be thinking about it in Ukraine? Yeah, I think the struggle for Ukraine reveals all of that, just, just as you say. A, a big intellectual mistake that a lot of people made after communism came to an end in Europe in 1989 or the end of the Soviet Union in 1991 was the notion that now there are no alternatives, to quote Maggie Thatcher. That was incorrect. There are always alternatives. Many, many people in the West thought that capitalism would automatically bring democracy. And that's a very comforting thought because you can hand over the, the, the process of democracy to a larger impersonal force, to an invisible hand. And if the invisible hand is doing the work, then maybe you don't have to do anything at all. That turns out not to be true. Both Russia and China and their different ways have shown that tyranny can be wed very easily to capitalism. And what's worse, if you, if you delegate all the work of freedom to impersonal forces, you're forgetting what freedom is. I mean, freedom is all about recognizing personal forces, resisting impersonal forces, acting against impersonal forces, becoming a personal force yourself. And if you take this to an extreme and just imagine that like letting everything hang out is all you need for freedom, you end up in these, in these catastrophic situations like the one that Russia is in, where wealth is so centralized in so few hands that the kinds of tyranny that, that you've always talking about become very hard to, to resist. So uh, the first step to repairing all of this is to recognize, and here the Ukrainians, as everyone has been saying, have done something essential, has been to recognize that history is also made by us. It's to recognize that freedom is a value not the result of some kind of process. And it has to be affirmed, sometimes with risk-taking, by us. Um, and it's, it's to resist notions of progress, but also to resist notions of fate. Uh, what Mr. Putin is talking about is fate. 
It's Ukraine's fate to be with Russia. It's Belarus's fate to be with Russia. A dictator's imagination of the past creates a single lane along which the future is going to travel. We have to re resist both inevitability, our own thoughtless optimism, and ideas of eternity, that there's just one way that the past, the future can go, and it's determined by a dictator's imagination of the past. And the way to do that is to be creative, right? It's to imagine multiple futures. And here the Ukrainians have been very helpful. From Maidan to the present, they've been helping us to imagine how things could be different. They've been helping to shake us out of, of undue optimism and undue pessimism. And I think if this moment that we're in now is, you know, which is a terrible moment, it's going to have a positive outcome. That positive outcome will have to do with the Ukrainians helping us to think out our way into multiple better futures. Um, yeah, I, I, I would just like to add to that, that again, very often you see this thinking that the past determines the present, not just influences the present, but determines the present and the future. So people say less things like, you know, about Russia, about Russia, not Ukraine, that, you know, for hundreds of years, they lived in an autocratic system, so they just can't have a democracy. And Ukraine shows us this is not true. They lived under the same Tsarist autocracy. They lived under the same Soviet autocracy. And they had even worse opening conditions than the Russian Federation because it's, they didn't have the natural resources of Russia. So it's a much poorer country, actually. And they chose differently. They chose to have a liberal democracy and fought repeatedly to protect it which means that even if you come from hundreds of years of autocracy, you can still choose democracy. And this is, I think, one of the things that infuriates Putin about Ukraine, because it's like a, 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 a poster in the face of the Russians that, look, you can choose differently. Because, you know, if, if the only example they had, I don't know, was the Netherlands or Sweden, then it could easily be excused that, you know, Sweden had a completely different history than Russia. So it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's inapplicable to us. But when people at Moscow look at Kyiv, they should ask themselves, hey, if they can do it, why can't we? And you know, it's the same thing with China and Taiwan. That you have these theories that, you know, something in Chinese civilization or Chinese history or whatever just prevents the establishment of a democracy in, uh, in, in, in China. So how do you explain Taiwan? Uh, even according to the Chinese, it's the same people, it's the same country, it's the same history, it's the same language. So how could they choose differently? And this is a very important from a historical perspective to understand that history is extremely important. It influences the present. It never determines the present and the future. You always have choice. There, there is a way of speaking about international politics that I feel I've been arguing against, not just for the last two weeks, but for the last several years, which is a way of talking about it like there are countries, like it's a game of risk, if you know what I mean. You know, there are, mm. there are pieces on the chessboard or on the playing board, and they have certain determined roles. And so Russia is always the autocracy, and the United States is always the country that comes in to, to fight the war at the last minute. And that, and that international politics is about understanding those roles and adjusting to them. And I think what you're saying and what Tim is saying is that actually it's not like that, that countries can change their roles. They can change mm -hmm. what they are. There is nothing inevitable about Russia being an autocratic dictatorship or a kleptocracy. Um, there is nothing inevitable about Ukraine being a colony of Russia, which is what, which is what it was um you know for, for 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 so many years in effect in the soviet empire and before that in the russian empire uh, absolutely it's it's not determined by history or geography or climate people say well you know russia they have all these frozen uh wastes so somehow well canada has frozen wastes right. if canada can be democracy wh what's so different about russian climate from canadian climate right. and if again a very good example is germany in 1945, you had a lot of people saying that, you know, that the Germans, they are a basket case. They are a lost case. There will always be a militaristic, totalitarian uh, uh, country. 
and the only thing we can do is, I don't know, break them up into little principalities or make them into peasants or something. And, you know, a couple of decades after the defeat of Nazism, and Germany is one of the leaders of the free world, one of the most liberal, one of the most democratic countries in the world. And it, it's, it's the same geography, it's the same climate, it's the same language, it's the same, I don't know, children's fairy tales. I remember as a student reading this article about the fairy tales of the Grimm brother and so forth, as if anticipating, anticipating Nazism. That if you tell these kinds of fairy tales to children, there is no way that you can avoid Nazism. And this is not true. Maybe they still tell the same fairy tales, but they have become one of the most liberal democratic countries in the world. Yeah, I mean, Han Hannah Arendt has this idea in her, in her, in her book, Origins of, of Totalitarianism, which is, of course, a very dark book. But she has this idea that the most important thing in life is renewal. Um, the ability to find, to invent new things, the human capacity to create new things. If we look at the language that Mr. Putin is using um, from, from Moscow, it's the exact opposite of that. It's all about deadening. It's all about closing, closing down the imagination. It's all about forbidding alternatives. It's all about the idea that things that happened in the past have to repeat over and over and over again in the form that the dictator likes. And what's, what's exciting about democracy, and the Ukrainians are helping us remember this, is that democracy is unpredictable. Look, Volodymyr Zelensky is unpredictable. Um, you know, he's a, he's a, a, a you know, a, 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 a Russian speaking comedian who basically came out of nowhere, you know, a Jew who won 73% in a free presidential election. That's what democracy can bring us. It can bring us unpredictable things. And, and now, you know, now he's a war president who's with his people and whose courage is, has inspired these Europeans and these Americans that we're talking about. That's unpredictable. Democracy gives you that chance. And the more democracy you have, the more unpredictability you have, and the more possibility for renewal that you have, the better possibility to break out of this gloom where things just, the dictator has to be in power forever and nothing new can ever be said and everything is gray and dreadful. Democracy helps us to break out of that. The Ukrainians are helping us to break out of that. Um, we have just a, a little bit of time left and I'd like to spend the last part of this conversation talking about um, what we can do, we in the West, we in the world, um, you all is in Israel, um, what can we do both specifically and more generally, um, how can we, um, how can people who are on this, on this, who are watching this conversation, how can they contribute to change? Um, how do we persuade our governments um, that this is of, of the kind of importance, the significance of this story? Um, it, it, Yuval, maybe you could begin with that. What, what should, what should, what should people listening to this conversation take away from it, and what can we do in the future? Well, talking to individual citizens, not to politicians and head of states, everybody can do something. You can donate. Um, if you're not wealthy, you can donate an old coat. There are people gathering clothes to send to Ukraine and to the, to the refugees. And you know, when you donate an old coat, it's not just an old coat. I mean, the act of donating empowers you. And if previously you think, oh, I can't do anything, then you start thinking afterwards, well, I did this. Maybe I can do another thing. It's it kind of a cascade. You can join, you know, the effort online of, the, uh, of fighting the online world, the, the, the online uh, war. As a citizen, let's say in a European country, the politicians in Europe uh, that are imposing the sanctions are very closely watching to see what would be the reaction of the population. I think many of them want to go harder, want to go f farther. But they're afraid that if they, I don't know, completely cut off the Russian banks and completely cut off, stop importing oil and gas, there will be a, a popular resentment of, you know, rising oil prices, lack of, of heating gas and so forth. So as a citizen, if you voice your opinion, you say, no, I'm willing to take on these difficulties and you give courage to your politicians to press forward. And maybe most importantly, it's always best to cooperate, to join some organization. 50 people cooperating in an organization, let's say to help refugees, can accomplish far, far more 
than 500 isolated activists, isolated individuals. So find a cause. Don't try to solve the, the whole world. Find a cause which is close to your heart and then find an organization that tries to deal with it and join it. If there is no organization, start it. The key is we need to strengthen organizations because this is the basis also for civil society and for democracy. Tim, what should we do? Um, so of course we should we should we should we should donate for the reasons that you've all gives. Um, I think there's a list on your screen. There are other lists out there. We should make it clear to our governments that this for us is a voting issue. That we just we don't care just about you know pocketbook things. That we also care about the future of the world or the future of, to use an old-fashioned phrase, the free world. That we understand that freedom rises and falls internationally, and we care about that, and we're going to vote on that, and we're not going to politic. We're not going to tolerate politicians who coddle or make excuses for Putin or his invasion. Um, another thing that we can do, which you've all also I think was hinting at we can try to get in touch with Russians um, by way of the internet. And if you do this, make sure that you're posting true and accurate information yourself. There are plenty of good sources about what's actually happening in Ukraine. You can do your part to make sure that Russians actually understand that so they can make the correct decisions for, for themselves. And we can take part in demonstrations, get out there. This is something that's, that's worth putting your body in public space for. Ukrainians are putting their body in public space in a way that risks their lives. The least that we can do is put our body in public space in a way that shows that we care. And if you're a European leader, at the end of this war, which may it come soon, Ukrainians need to see a future. They need mm. to see that they have a future inside Europe. They're going to have to be able to come out of this war with something that they didn't have when this war started. It's not just that they deserve it. It's that this is part of that better future, which now we can start to imagine. Ukraine needs to have the prospect of joining the European Union. So I will um, conclude by emphasizing that and by repeating some of the things that we were asked by um, our Ukrainian colleague at the beginning of the program. Um, Ukraine needs weapons and it needs um, anti-tank weapons. Um, it needs drones. It needs them fast. Um, they should have been given to them before this war. They asked for them before the war. Um, it wasn't done. Um, it's time to do it now. Um, and those of you who are anti-war and who hate the idea of violence, remember that these are weapons that are defending people from violence. Um, you are not aiding, you are not warmongering, you are not, um, you, you know, you're not, you're not part of the problem if you're giving Ukraine weapons, you're helping defend people and keep people safe and keep and make sure that this war ends quickly. Um, we now see that there is a, you know, Russian random bombardment of cities. Um, the Ukrainians have to be able to fight back um, right now. Um, a a no-fly zone, if it's possible to create it without provoking the Russians, without, without widening the war, um, if, we can, if we can prevent the Russians from being, being able to use their aircraft to, to bombard cities in Ukraine, uh, that's extremely important. Um, charity, money for, for refugees, but also for people inside Ukraine, for medical units, for supplies. Um, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are, you know, remember that the Ukrainians are bravely not only fighting in the streets, but there are also people who are making the hospitals work and people who are taking care of children at home um, and people who are keeping food in distribution and, and making sure that the economy works well enough to keep people alive. Um, all of that is is um, is incredibly important as well. Um, and so I call on anybody who's watching this and anybody who can influence those decisions um, to help Ukraine in, in whatever way you can. Um, I'm going to conclude now by asking each of the speakers to make their closing remarks, um, uh, you know, to, to make, to, to sum up the conversation in any way they want. Um, please, um, you've all. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just repeat maybe the two most important points. First, that the war is about the existence of the Ukrainian nation. And in this sense, Putin has already lost it because even people who didn't know anything about Ukraine a week ago now know that this is a very real nation fighting for its survival and it cannot be absorbed into Russia, no matter what are the fantasies of Putin. And the other thing is, as we just said about the future, that I think 
the level of admiration and gratitude that now people all over the world, not just the European Union, have for Ukrainians and for Ukraine, uh, also guarantees that I can say personally that I will be there, we will be there to help you rebuild Ukraine as a prosperous democratic country when this is all over. We won't forget, we won't abandon you. Tim, your final thoughts. So uh, as a historian, I tried to stress at the beginning that Ukraine has been at the center of world historical processes. It's been at the center of 20th century totalitarianism. It was at the center of both Hitler and Stalin's plan for the world. In the 21st century, we are seeing that Ukraine has been at the center of very important developments as well. It's at the center of cyber war. It was in 2014. It is again now. It is at the center of the struggle against oligarchy or hydrocarbon oligarchy, which is a great problem of the 21st century. And insofar as we have a future in which we get over our 20th century and our 21st century problems, Ukraine will also be at the center of that. So, vam sem, blažaju, vseho najkrašeho, nezalaznosti i zdravja. Uh, thank you to my two extraordinary guests. Um, thank you to the audience from all over the world. The three of us are in many are in three different places. Um, we know that you all are too, um, but we hope as a as a world community that all of you who are here and who've joined this conversation will be contributing to the success and the future of Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the Yes Foundation for organizing this. Um, with such, uh, you know, at the, at the last minute and with such, um, with such professionalism and skill. Uh, thank you again and Slava Ukraine.